Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I'm here today to talk to you about one of the greatest evangelical tools that is out there. It's also probably the most underutilized evangelical tool because everyone pretty much has one, but they don't often think of it as something that can be used for evangelism. And here I mean evangelism simply as sharing the good news. Can you take a guess as to what that evangelical tool might be? It is your table. Something that's probably found in every one of your homes, or maybe you have multiple. But have you ever thought of your table as a center for evangelism? As a place where you can bring the blessings of Jesus to bear in the lives of people who maybe are so far away from the step of coming into a building such as this. But we get a beautiful display of this in our gospel reading today. But I wanted to start by asking you if you've ever been to a dinner where the placement of the seating and the table that you sat at made a difference where there were places of more honor and less honor, where you were tempted to try and pick a certain space so as to raise up your own reputation. Now, I have to admit, I've never been to such a dinner. I don't know what I would do if I was in that situation. So I drew on the only direct experience that I know, which is when you get together with your family and there's an adult's table and a kid's table. Now, not to say that being at the kids' table is dishonoring in some way, it certainly isn't. And for most of the time you sit at the kids' table, it doesn't bother you, you don't have any conception of that. But once you hit a certain age at the kids' table, you start to think, what am I doing here with all of these children? Of course, you're still a child, but you don't think so. You're at the mighty age of 13, and you belong at the adults' table, so why are you still stuck here? But there are dinners where the table seating does matter. And we have examples in the time that Jesus was walking the earth from the culture then that this is true. Jesus himself was invited to such dinners, and he preached about why he doesn't like that. And at those dinners, usually the host is the place that everything comes to, and so if you sit close to the host, you're the more honored guest and those who are further away are not. And if you can think of, um, if you've seen shows that have earthly kings and they're holding a banquet, the less important people are at the far end of the room, as far away from the king as possible, and the important people are sitting close by. Well, this is the sort of context that Jesus introduces his table fellowship into human society. And before we get too judgmental about the way the Pharisees respond to what Jesus does, There's nothing unique about the hierarchy of honor and table fellowship in first century Judah and Palestine. That has been something that has existed in human cultures throughout all time and place, and it is true even today. And this is precisely why what Jesus does in our gospel reading is so shocking. He does the thing that does not come natural to any human being. He doesn't arrange a gathering of multiple people into some sort of comparison of reputation, of power, or of worth. And people don't know what to do. They don't know what this means and why somebody who is as well regarded and known as a teacher like Jesus of Nazareth, what is he up to? What is he trying to do? He's doing the opposite of what comes natural. He, the most important person in all of history, the incarnate Son of God, is sitting with the scum, the outcast, the ignored. And He's not just sitting with them, but eating with them and talking to them, and the world goes crazy. He's messing with the status quo. So, Before we hop back to the table, we first need to deal with the small matter of the calling of the disciple who wrote the very gospel reading we read today. And even this activity of God indicates the same truth that we'll look at with the table. So who's Matthew? Well, Matthew's a tax collector, and he's sitting at a tax booth when Jesus sees him, 
And it's sort of funny, this is the most life-changing event in the life of Matthew, and now we know for a lot of the church, and the way Matthew records it is very bland and matter-of-fact. He pretty much says, well, Jesus saw me, and He said, follow me, and I went. And then He just moves on. Jesus saw Him and called Him, and that was it. But it was a pretty significant thing that Jesus did. And in order to understand that, we have to really have an understanding of what it meant to be a tax collector. Growing up in Sunday school, we all pretty much have a sense that tax collectors were not people that people like, right? And when you have to pay your taxes, it doesn't make you happy, so you can understand where that feeling comes from. But there's more to the story than that. There's a couple of theories, two main ones, about why people didn't like tax collectors. One is that they were seen as traitors to their people because they would have been working for Rome. If you've seen the series Chosen, this is the way they portray Matthew, that he's disliked even by his own family because they view him as a traitor to their people, and he's taxing the people of God on behalf of a foreign power in Rome. And there would also be the sense of a religious impurity and uncleanness in being associated with the pagan Roman Empire. But there's another theory as well, and that is maybe even more human and less specific. Um, Because in Galilee, where this is taking place, the connection to Rome was a little more distant because Herod Antipas, who was the ruler of that area, would have been the one responsible for hiring the tax collectors. And even though he's reporting to Rome, because he's not really in charge, the people on the ground wouldn't have made the connection so quickly as they would in other places. So what made it so that they didn't like the tax collectors even in that setup? Well, you can probably guess it's because of greed and dishonesty. You see, if somebody wanted to be a tax collector in a region, they would have to make a bid to the ruler. And whoever made the highest bid would get the position, but they had to put up their own funds, and so it naturally tempted the tax collector to abuse his position to recoup the money he'd lost in becoming a tax collector. Thus, people don't really like them. They abuse their position. And this sort of person, Jesus sees and says, follow me. Not an insignificant act. Because a tax collector isn't just disliked by a few people. Their dislike is related to something very public, something everybody knows about, something everybody recognizes, and they would all be able to associate Matthew with whoever he was with. But Jesus calls him just the same, and he doesn't think much about it. He sees him and says, follow me, and Matthew follows him. Now we come to the table, the table in our gospel story. Jesus goes to what we presume is Matthew's home, and if being around Matthew wasn't bad enough, it says that a bunch of other tax collectors showed up. So now Jesus is the favorite of all the tax collectors in the area, which means he's not the favorite of everyone else and other sinners, the text says. And he's not just talking with them, but he's in their home, he's reclining with them at table and speaking with them and fellowshipping with them. And in first century Palestine, as we will see, that's no small thing. But first, what does Matthew mean here by the word sinners, these other sinners? Because as any good Lutheran who's been taught in our education would say, well, well, pastor, that would mean everybody. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But here Matthew's using this term in a more narrow sense. He's calling out something more specific, and we can see this by the reaction of the Pharisees. The Pharisees come to the disciples because it's not just Jesus at the table, but His disciples, and they're saying, you know, why is your teacher eating with these people? If they were just your run-of-the-mill, well, I had a bad day and I didn't, I didn't do the, the law perfectly today, Um, they probably wouldn't have had that reaction. But instead, these are all people who are well known as being outside of the law of God, outside of polite society, the outcasts, like tax collectors. And so they ask the question, what's your teacher doing eating with these people, fellowshipping with these people? Doesn't he know who they are? 
Before we get to Jesus' answer, we're going to hop back to table fellowship. What did it mean for Jesus to share a table with these people? Some of it we maybe understand, but there are a few things that are kind of unique. So in order to really understand what this signified for Jesus to be with these people in this context, I want to do a little thought project. I want you to imagine that you live in a community, and maybe you grew up in a community like this, where it's small enough to where everybody kind of knows everybody, and you know generally what's going on in the community, good, the bad, and the ugly. Right? And every one of those types of communities has somebody or some group of people that are not well regarded by the polite members of that community. Now imagine that you're somebody who's, you know, of some no- notoriety in a good way in your community, and one of these people, these deplorables, these outcasts, the criminal, the one who isn't looked on well by the polite society, invites you to their home and has dinner with you and you go. What is the reaction of the people around in that community going to be? And if you grew up in a small town, I don't have to explain that to you. You become automatically associated with that person, and people begin to question your character. Well, wow, he's, he hangs out with these sorts of people. What kind of person is he really? Maybe I was wrong about him. It's a scandal. It's a scandal because somebody like you is not supposed to be with somebody like them. See, we can understand that because that's still true largely even today. If somebody was a notorious criminal and you had them over for dinner at your house and your neighbors found out, you can't just say, well, just some person I had over for dinner. They're going to associate you with them and wonder, what's the connection? Why did you do that? Did you know them from the past? Did you used to be a drug dealer yourself? All the questions start coming around. Turns out that when you hang out with people and have food with them, people assume that you know them or that you have some connection. But Jesus' answer to the Pharisees' question of, why are you eating with these people, speaks to an even greater scandal. It isn't just that He's sharing space with them at a dinner. But the way in which he conducts himself with these people, who everybody else would rather push off to the side and forget about, speaks of an even greater level of intimacy and fellowship and desire on Jesus' part. See, here's the question that they're asking his disciples, and he responds, and he says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And Jesus is living out that reality as He's speaking those words. He just called Matthew to be His disciple, and now He's at a table full of tax collectors and sinners, and He's transforming their lives and sharing the Word of God with them and calling them into this new life. So his answer indicates that Jesus' interaction with them goes beyond just sitting in the same room and sharing a table. And we know from his other instances in the the book of Luke that he's not about the jockeying for a position next to Jesus as being the high-honored position and the lower-honored position. Instead, everyone is treated as important to Jesus at his table. So this vision that the Pharisees are seeing, they don't know what to make of it. This isn't the way human beings behave. This isn't how things go. How can you do that to, with and for these sorts of people? Don't you know they're sinners? And in one of the Luke ones, they even essentially are treating it like if Jesus is touched by this person, then He will become like them. And little do they know how right they are. That's precisely what Jesus intends to do. He intends to take the thing that makes them unclean and deplorable and outcast upon Himself. That is, in fact, how it works. And it's precisely the reason that He has come to the places that He has come. This is what He means when He says that He calls the sinners, that He comes to the sick, It wasn't an accident. He didn't just so happen to like the person he talked to. He sought them out because they needed him. 
this simple truth on display with Matthew and at the table in his house is the heart and core of the gospel. It is the good news of Jesus that God comes for sinners, that our redemption draws near. It's why when we read things in the Bible that say all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, they're not despair-inducing statements. Because we also know that sinners are the people whom God has sent Jesus to find to take their sin upon Himself and to heal them, to make them whole, to make them new, to make them righteous. So just as Jesus walking by the tax collector's booth sees Matthew, so he sees you, really sees you, and calls you, and sits at table with you, and heals you, and washes away all that makes you unclean with his very precious blood. So let today's text be a reminder of you for two things. First, that when you're feeling unlovable and unworthy, and we all feel this way at one time or another, consumed of the guilt and shame of our own sin, of the things that we don't do that we know we should and the things that we've done that we know we shouldn't have done, the reason that we have confession at the beginning of every service. Let this remind you that this doesn't disqualify you from the love of God It, in fact, means that you are precisely the person He is seeking. For He has come not to call the righteous, but the sinner. He's not come to the healthy, but the sick. So you can make that confession of sin, and it isn't a despairing statement. You can face the reality of your own sinfulness because you know that God's love is for people such as yourself. For Jesus makes no distinction. He doesn't demand a worthiness or a sacrifice in order for you to be around Him, but in mercy He comes and finds you and makes you His own. The second reminder is this, that as disciples of Jesus, you have been called to do much the same. It's important to note that when Jesus goes to Matthew's house and is around all of these people, He doesn't say, oh, for the sake of my future ministry, I need to send my disciples elsewhere. It specifically says they are there at the table too. For that is what it means when Jesus says, follow me. You're going to find yourself in situations that don't come naturally to you. Situations that other people won't understand, such as eating food with people that everybody else would rather ignore. And we're called to do that for the same reason that Jesus found us, so that they too can know the love of God in Jesus, a love for sinners, a love for the sick that brings healing and redemption and life. So dear friends in Christ, may the word of God which you have heard today dwell in your hearts. May it well up in you a spirit of grace and compassion and of the love for those in need, just as you and I were in need when God sought us out by sending His Son, Jesus. And you can believe the words He says to you today. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Thanks be to God for Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the peace of God dwell in you, which is beyond our understanding. A peace that comes from knowing that a God loves you even though you're unlovable. And in so doing, makes you His righteous children. May this peace, born through Jesus, guard your hearts and minds until He comes again to make all things new. Amen.